I had people that stare at me all the time because I do walk with a limp and I have some odd movements. But I don't mind that because at least they're looking. And then I had the opportunity to tell them my story. When Albert Einstein was a child, people told him he'd never amount to anything because he was dyslexic. People also told Franklin Roosevelt that he'd never be president because he couldn't walk, and Ray Charles that he couldn't read music because he was blind. Imagine what our world would be like if they believed it. What lies beneath, seeing beyond disability. This week on My Healthy Mind, let's talk about it. Welcome to My Healthy Mind. I'm Michael Hunter. Marina Morris was a Russian orphan who was born with cerebral palsy and brought to the United States at the age of six. Marina does not think of herself as disabled. She's never thought of herself as disabled. That's mostly because she was brought up by parents who didn't see her as disabled and who would not allow her to see herself that way. It made all the difference. Today, my colleague Elizabeth Atkins talks with this remarkable young woman. Marina, welcome to My Healthy Mind. Thank you, I'm very, very happy to be here. We're glad to have you. So you're a college grad, a business professional, a public speaker, and an accomplished golfer. And by the way, you have cerebral palsy. Tell us who you are. Who I am. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so I am a scholar. I graduated Adrian College in 2014. I also paint as well. I. And like I said, I'm a wife, I, um, I'm a business professional. So Marina, in describing all these wonderful things mm -hmm. that you do, you never mentioned cerebral palsy. I would never do that because although it's a part of who I am, it's not who I am by any stretch of the imagination. So let's start from the beginning. Tell us about your background. I was born in Russia and I was adopted from Russia when I was five years old. And then later I was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. So tell us what is cerebral palsy? What causes it? What are the characteristics of it? So cerebral palsy is a neuromuscular disorder which causes a variety of different symptoms. And like autism, it ranges. Mm -hmm. So you have people with mild CP and then you have people with very chronic CP. The kind that I have is called dystonic hemiplegia, which means that it affects my right side of the body. Mm -hmm. um, my hands shake and I do walk with a limp, so this is my hand, this is my right hand. It's always in that position going that way. This is me controlling it with my mind and to, to make sure I don't shake more. But if I stop controlling it, it this is what it does. And so it'll turn off when I'm sleeping and stuff and all that, but uh, this is what it does on a normal basis. And then I also walk with a limp. Some people with CP though are, they're in wheelchairs. They have things called laryngeal spasms, so it's very difficult for them to talk. Um, their muscles are more, you know, like this, and it's difficult for them to use their hands or to use their feet or to use any part of the body. Um, is it all. permanent? It is. You're born with it. It happens at birth. Hello there. Uh, my friends at the Cerebral Palsy Foundation asked if I have any advice on how to start a conversation with someone who has disabilities. So maybe let's start with what not to do. Uh, don't mumble or stare or blurt out an intimate detail from your own life. And whatever you do, don't speak extra loud as if you think being in a wheelchair is somehow the same as wearing noise-canceling headphones. Frankly, those aren't particularly good ways to start a conversation with anyone. Essentially, the best thing to do is just say hi and then go from there. When somebody is described as having this, in effect, brain injury, um, they have certain limitations. And when it's 
then described as the label of dis disabled, it allows them to qualify for certain services. Unfortunately, that label can turn into something negative because it can stigmatize that person from how other people see them. That can uh, limit them in terms of what they think of themselves as being able to do or limit us from being able to see them as a whole person, to see behind what that label is and see them as who they really are. So having cerebral palsy and living in an orphanage in Russia, what was that like? It was tough. Um, I don't think the Russian orphanage really knew what was wrong with me. They knew that something was different, but living in an environment where the kids would make fun of me or, or push me or pull my hair uh, because I was different, that was tough. How did the adults treat you? Not very well. Um, not necessarily because I had cerebral palsy, but the orphanage didn't have a lot of money to give to their kids. They didn't have a lot to work with, so they tried their best. But being different, the adult, our mama knew that I was different, and she definitely made it known to other kids. It was rough. So in that environment, how did you view yourself? I didn't think I was different. But being six, I didn't really think too much of it. If you look here in society today, kids are very much less quick to judge than adults. So I didn't see myself as anything, any type of different person. Can you describe the physical environment that you were in? Yeah, um, I can, when I close my eyes, I can see it perfectly. You, you had stairs, I had, each kid had their own locker and their own bed. And each kid had a picture on the locker in bed. I was a fish, <laughs> which is ironic. Get this, okay? I was a fish. My name is Marina, which means the sea in Russian, and it's a place where I park boats in America. So it's, it's perfect. I was a fish. So we weren't really known for our names. They kind of just knew us by the animal that we were associated with, which, again, I didn't know the difference. You know, living in a very tight orphanage, I didn't know anything about the outside. I didn't know what life was supposed to be like. I didn't know what a mom and dad was. I thought this was my normal. It was my normal. I didn't know anything else. Marina, did having cerebral palsy serve as a hindrance to you being adopted? Yes, at sometimes it was because I, I knew that I was different. So I, was, I always thought what mom and dad would, could possibly want a little girl with shaky hands and that walks with a limp. I wasn't normal, I was different. So I'm, I, I always thought to myself, there's no way that some mom and dad is going to want a defective kid. You know, I, there was just no way that anybody would take me. And that, that was a rough thing to think about when you were six. Did you see other kids being adopted around you? That was so hard. Um, before my mom and dad finally got me, my best friend was adopted. Mm -hmm. And that was tough. Because he was, he was about the only one that was nice. <laughs> you know, friendly with me and nice with me and treating me the same as everybody else. And to watch kids go out of the orphanage forever and I never get to see them again, that was tough. Because I really, I really, really wanted that. I didn't want to stay there forever. So tell us what it was like when your parents showed up. Oh, okay. Um, oh my gosh, it's so hard to describe the moment that I saw them. Because unless you're in that moment or in that situation, it's hard to describe. It's when I first saw my dad. I, we, I, my mom and my mom and dad have a picture of me. My hand was tiny, and he he, he stuck out his finger, and I was holding his finger. And at that moment, I'm like, I'm absolutely sure that these guys are here to take me home. I was so happy. Oh my gosh! And when after my dad gave me a hug, and he, my mom came to me. I was floored. I'm like, I've never seen a more beautiful woman in my entire life. I'm like, if this woman is here to take me home, I'm okay with that. And if I grow up looking like her, I'm completely okay with that too. <laughs> she was beautiful and I was so lucky. So Marina, tell us about what it was like when you came to the United States and learned why your parents adopted yeah. you. Um, my parents got a book of all the children in my orphanage and they were flipping through it and my dad told me, 
the, the one of the mo main reasons why we adopted you is because you were the only one smiling and, and to this day I'm just still smiling because I'm so blessed and lucky to be here. I mean, you can't imagine what it was like going from living with 30 other kids, not having anybody to really look up to or to love you, to go, going from there to a place I walked into my bedroom for the first time and I saw stuffed animals. I saw a bed and I saw blankets and I saw so many clothes. And the most important thing I didn't see is another kid. <laughs> so you're six years old, you're in the United States and you're starting school. What was that like? Oh my gosh. The first day of school, they dropped me off and they left. I thought they left me for good. Because mind you, I come from an orphanage with 30 other kids in a building. They dropped me off in a building with 30 other kids. And I thought to myself, this is it. I'm too, I'm too much of a bad girl. There's no way they're going to come back. And this went on for a good couple of weeks until I realized, OK, I'm here to stay. They had to reassure me. And I didn't speak very good English at the time. So for them to communicate that with me was pretty rough. But eventually, I'm like, OK, they'll be back. <laughs> I hope they'll be back. So that was rough. but. And how did you feel amongst the children? How were you treated? Were you bullied? No. Teased? No. I was not in America, no. Um, they knew that I was different, um, but they didn't, they didn't treat me any differently than any of the other kids. I could play. I could play on the monkey bars. I played on the swings. I took naps with them. I played Legos and everything else. I could do everything they did, but I just did it in a different way. So there wasn't much of a struggle between them seeing me for something other than my cerebral policy. They just didn't know. They didn't care. I was a kid just like them, and I wanted to play with them. So they didn't care. So Marina, it sounds like your parents were extremely supportive. Can you tell us about your mom's personality, your dad's personality, and how they encouraged you? Yeah, absolutely. I'll start with my dad. My dad was the very compassionate dad. He said, you know, he always made sure that things were okay for me, and if I, was, if I would go to him crying and say, this person made fun of me, he would make me feel better. He was compassionate. If I didn't want to do something, he's like, okay, that's fine, we'll try later. My mom is the kind of mother that says, just because you failed this time, doesn't mean you're always going to fail. Get up and do it again. You know, she, she's strong like that. She has a very strong personality. And she expected a lot out of me because I was her child. And I wanted to give her a lot because I was her child. She's very accomplished, very, very accomplished. And I wanted to be like her. And very early on, they advocated for yeah. you. Tell me about art class. Um, when I was in the second grade, the last period of every day was art class. And I remember, I thought this was normal. I sat in the hallway. Um, and the reason I did so is because when they would be cutting paper, I couldn't really use scissors to cut a straight line, so I would have to sit in the hallway until our class was over. The moment that my mom found out about that, she came to school to pick me up, and she said, why are you in the hallway? What did you do? She grabbed my hand, she opened the door, she walked straight in, and she looked at my teacher, and she goes, who cares? If my kid cannot cut a straight line with scissors, unless she's going to be a seamstress, FYI, I am not a seamstress. And then she said something that, that I've, always, I've always carried with me to, to this day. She says, she deserves art class. They, they, they always told me, just because you may have a disability, just because you may have cerebral palsy, it doesn't stop you from doing anything. And it never should. And it's never going to. My parents are very, um, they're very important to me. They were really um, instilled a sense of confidence in me. And I, don't, I, I know for a fact that I would not be where I am today if they weren't the ones who picked me up. Welcome to My Healthy Mind a show that dares to talk about mental health matters that touch nearly every family. Each week you'll meet guests who share their stories, hear from local experts, and learn about resources that may help. And so I was in a committee meeting at the House of Representatives when I realized that my daughter had autism. We need to take the stigma away from mental health issues. No topics about mental health and wellness are off limits on our show. Let's talk about it. 
on My Healthy Mind. It's like a little voice that says, they're gonna hate your food, but it's all the time. I'm here for you, man. And if your food sucks, I'll tell you. <laughs> So when it comes to somebody who's been described as disabled, people don't seem to understand that that doesn't keep them from being able to be very productive citizens. There's almost 19 million people in the United States that still work, pay taxes, are productive, and contribute to society. And in being utilized like that, even though sometimes it means that the employer has to give them certain allowances, the result is that they feel important, they can master their own life, they can feel some independence. It's important to realize that we need to see them for what they can do instead of seeing them for what we think they can't do. How did you become a public speaker and advocate? How did you take this message to stages to reach lots of people? Um, it all started in college, freshman year of college. Before I got to Adrian College, I was always very shy and self-conscious about my shaking hands. I would always sit on my hands in class. I would put them in between my knees to stop them from shaking. It's something that I started doing in high school because I felt like everybody behind me was staring at me shaking. I didn't want people to see me as anything different, so I would do that. And when I got to college, my parents were not with me anymore. They were at home. I had to be a grown up. I had to be an adult. I had to say, enough is enough. I can't sit by watching my life flash before my eyes, go before my eyes, without trying everything that I wanted to try. So, freshman year of college, my roommate comes into my room and she's like, Marina, I'm trying out for the Adrian College Talent Show. Come with me. So I said, okay. She said, so, Dan Danny, my roommate Danny had a beautiful voice, like an angel, and I wanted to support her. And after she was done, I was in the corner clapping, I'm like, yeah, go girl, you got this, you got this, woo woo. And, and the judges looked at her and then they looked at me and they're like, who's your friend over there? And she says, oh, that, that's my roommate Marina and she writes poetry. I'm like, I can't believe she just said that. And the judges stand up and they're like, well, have you ever tried to try out for a talent show? I'm like, uh, no, <laughs> I don't like speaking. I don't like being the center of attention. But I, I, I said, you know what, I'm gonna do it. So I got out my laptop and I read a couple of poems. Two weeks later, I got the phone call saying, congratulations, you just made it into the Adrian College Talent Show. And I'm like, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> Not good. Um, that day, I got on stage, I brought it to me my poems, and I was really nervous because I knew all eyes were on me. I was shaking like I used to do, and I thought, my God, that's all people are going to see is my shaky hands. What am I doing? So I started to make jokes because I was nervous, and that's, that's how I, I, I was calm, was if I made jokes. And throughout my poetry reading, I made more and more jokes. So at the end of the talent show, the judges get up and they say, Third prize goes to Marina Morris for stand-up comedy and poetry. Oh. I'm like, are you really? Um, so, and I was excited. And during the show, the president of Adrian College, Jeffrey Docking, was in the crowd, and he saw me. And the next year, he invited me to come speak at the president's dinner. And I thought to myself, why? <laughs> I don't like public speaking. But then I knew, I'm like, okay, this is the start of something new. I have to challenge myself. I can't live in a corner. I can't live being scared of who I am. I have cerebral palsy, but that's, that's nothing. So I said, yes, I'll do it. And I spoke about hope, and I got a standing ovation from them. And then I got asked to speak at the president's luncheon and a couple other events on campus, to sports teams, to classes, to everybody. And when I graduated Adrian College, my mom sent me a email, an email saying, you should try out for TEDx, Muskegon. And I thought to myself, okay, maybe, maybe this is a time where I really have to get out of my skin and let people see me for who I am. Marina Morris, five for one, blonde girl who makes jokes. Not Marina Morris, five for one with cerebral palsy, because it's not who I am.
the Cerebral Palsy Foundation knows that I have CP, so they asked me if there are ways particularly that I like that people start conversations with me. There are a couple. Uh, one is, hey, I've seen some of the games that you do. You do a great job. Uh, another is, wow, you're hot in person. It's simple. Just say hi. Stories are so powerful. People can relate to you. You want that. The day that I stood up on that stage freshman year of college doing the talent show was the day that changed my entire life. Sometimes you just gotta, you just gotta say yes to opportunities that come your way. Because in the back of my mind, you may perceive people making fun of you. You may, be, you may think that people are looking at you differently, but in reality, that's not the case. It's not the case because you're not letting them. You're letting them see Marina, the advocate, the, the wife, the data analyst. You're letting them see her. You're not letting them see cerebral palsy. And once you get to know me, you completely forget that I have it in the first place. That's so important. Disability is not who you are, it's just a part of you. And now you're married. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> my husband is wonderful. Well, tell us about your husband, how you <sighs> met and how you feel now, how yeah. long you've been married. I met my husband in 2012 online. Uh, I posted a picture of me in pigtails and I captioned it saying, I look like I'm 12. And he saw it and he commented back. He said, I have a baby face too. So naturally in this day and age, I stalked him and I looked at his pictures and I said, okay, he's kind of cute. Maybe I should start talking to him. We started talking and then we, t we Skyped because I wanted to make sure that he was who he said he was. And, and then we met on my 21st birthday at the bar. I told him to come and meet me. And as soon as he walked through the door, I was done. Um, our first date was at the zoo, and he grabbed my hand out of nowhere, and it just stopped shaking. And I'm like, okay, this is real. This is for real. And, um, God, it's really difficult to describe how much I love my husband. He is my hero. He's my best friend. He's my soulmate. He's been there for me through everything that life has to give. And not once, not once, did he ever see me as a girl with cerebral palsy. He just saw Marina. And I just fell in love with him immediately. So you are the complete whole package. You are <laughs> a you. rock star. Thank you. You may not realize it, but these words, often used to describe someone with a mental health condition, can be very harmful. In a country where one in five people are affected by a mental health condition, it's time for all of us to step up and change the conversation. Just because someone's struggle isn't obvious on the outside doesn't mean they aren't hurting on the inside. We need to see the person, not the condition. Join with me, pledge to be stigma free. Welcome to My Healthy Mind a show that dares to talk about mental health matters that touch nearly every family. Each week you'll meet guests who share their stories, hear from local experts, and learn about resources that may help. And so I was in a committee meeting at the House of Representatives when I realized that my daughter had autism. We need to take the stigma away from mental health issues. No topics about mental health and wellness are off limits on our show. Let's talk about it on My Healthy Mind. So the question is, how do you get to what lies beneath? Well, first you have to look beyond the surface to the whole person. It is important to learn about the condition and any actual limitations in order to figure out ways to work around them, if possible. We can all afford to be kind to make some allowances and accommodations. We all need to set an example to create an inclusive environment, a positive can-do culture. We need to educate and to advocate to talk about what these conditions are and what's possible to talk to people with physical and mental limitations with understanding, with compassion, and without fear. 
It's up to all of us to break the ice. Most of all, do not permit or tolerate any display of disrespect, period. Tell me, what message do you have for people who are watching you today and might have a disability? I want them to look in the mirror and I want them to see themselves without that disability. Everybody watching this show right now, if you have a disability, any type of disability, remember that it's not who you are, it's just a part of who you are. And the moment you say to yourself, I'm more than that, I can't tell you how much your life is gonna change. It's gonna change drastically, and in a good way, in a very good way. We hope you've enjoyed our show today. I'd like to say what a privilege it's been for all of us here at My Healthy Mind to meet this amazing young woman, Marina Morris, with her upbeat personality and her inspiring story. If you'd like to talk or read more about seeing beyond disability or any mental health issue, please reach out to us on our website, MyHealthyMind.com, through Twitter at MyHealthyMind or on Facebook. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week for another edition of My Healthy Mind. Let's talk about it. And now we'll leave you with My Healthy Minute. My Healthy Minute, covering breaking mental health news, legislation, discoveries, and resources. The Chronic Illness Awareness Coalition is a 30-year-old nonprofit organization made up of men and women from around the healthcare industry. We're working together to improve the quality of life for those affected with both physical and mental health issues. We do this through education and advocacy. We educate the local community through seminars, which we hold in it, talking about physical and mental health issues that range from mild to severe. We talk to healthcare professionals, primarily through our membership meetings that are six times a year. We have a speaker come in and they'll talk about things such as best practices or innovations in technology and healthcare. This allows us to bring that information back to our organizations and clinics to have better patient interaction, uh, better patient outcomes. And we do advocacy by talking to local legislators, letting them know if we feel a law or a ruling is going to negatively impact a person with a chronic illness. We want people to know that over 45% of the population is affected with some sort of a chronic illness. And the more severe that chronic illness, the more difficult it is to find prescription medication, a specialist, or someone that takes your health insurance. So join us in help advocating for people with chronic illnesses and disabilities. Mm -hmm.